Thank you for tuning in to Hope TV, the television broadcast ministry of Hope Alive Freedom Church. We are real people offering real hope in a real world. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. I want to talk to you today about who is really the most interesting and influential man in the world today. Now, there are all kinds of men that are represented here today or even watching by television today, all different types. Well, there's a passive man, which is the, the male who is unable or unwilling to take the leadership role that God has assigned for him to have. He passes it up. He, lo he overlooks it, won't assume that role. Then there's the domineering man. The domineering man is the male who thinks manhood is measured by his ability to either mentally, emotionally, and or physically dominate you, to control you. Then there's the sexual man. The sexual man is the male who measures his manhood by the amount of women he has conquered. Don't shout me down when I know I just, I just called somebody out this morning. Then there's the corporate man, or the everybody knows about the company man. There's the corporate man or the company man. He is the male who defines his manhood by the amount of time that he invests into his career and or the amount of money that he can accure. How much money can he gather for himself? Then there's the irresponsible man. That's the male who refuses to provide properly for the well-being of those underneath his care. I don't know if you saw this news story this past week, but there's a man that has fathered 22 children by 12 different mothers. And he's not taking care of one. I thought to myself, for that irresponsibility, there should be a law against that. I think that perhaps he would have to work off his debt to society because we know that tax dollars are paying for his irresponsibility. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good this morning. The irresponsible man, he's just a donor when it comes to child giving or childbirth. He, nothing more, nothing less. He's irresponsible. Then there's the hedonistic man. That is the male who lives for self-gratifying pleasures at the expense of those around him. It doesn't matter how it's going to affect you. All that matters to him is how he pleases himself. As a matter of fact, he's so arrogant. He's so full of himself. He don't care what the preacher thinks. 
He don't care what his family thinks. He says, I'm going to make my own decisions. And then when they try to get a little spiritual, they'll say that they'll try to uh, use a little Jesus to reinforce their rebellion. I want you to know that rebellion and Jesus don't go together. And I want you to know that God sees right through that. The lack of your humility, God sees right through that. But today, I'm, I believe that God's looking for a different kind of man. I believe that God's looking, uh, not looking for a worldly man that's driven by his brute nat- by the brute nature of his, uh, of his anatomy. God's looking for a kingdom man. As a matter of fact, I'd go so far to say that there are probably many single women that have filled, the ha- filled houses of faith all over the world that are looking for the same thing. Looking for a kingdom man. Ladies, can you help me preach today? Am I, am I, am I saying the right thing? God's looking for a different kind of man. And this morning, we're not here to celebrate gender. Nor are we here to celebrate little boys who don't have the vaguest idea about what does it mean to be a man. We are here this morning to celebrate fathers, men of faith, men of God, kingdom men. Amen? Now, I want you to know that God, uh, uh, the world doesn't need another Dostakis man. It needs kingdom men to stand up and to take their place in this world and fill in the gap where, it, where manhood, biblical manhood, has been lacking. Now, you might say, well, pastor, can you tell me what a kingdom man is? I'd be glad to. A kingdom man is one who operates under a king's agenda, not his own. See, he lives in a kingdom He yields to a king who has an agenda, who has a plan, already written out, the rules already written, and a kingdom man operates under the king's agenda. His marching orders are established by King Jesus. His SOP, his employee handbook, is the word of the living God. That's his rule of life. It is a lamp unto his feet. It is a light to his path. His every footstep is ordered, directed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Are there such men in the house of God here this morning? Well, there's there's about three. I can call a physician here to do a physical exam to check the rest of you out. Now, let me give you a rule of thumb. I know you might be thinking it's a little warm. I see a lot of you guys fanning yourself, and I'm going to give you a rule of thumb. This is how this thing works on Sunday mornings, right? The more responsive you are to me, the quicker you get out of the heat. So when I do those little pauses like that, right, that's the time you say amen or ouch, oops, was that for me? It's okay to respond. Somebody say, kind of like that. And that includes the male. Now, I understand for you, it might be ouch because you're not a kingdom man. So throughout the rest of the morning, when, when you see, see, hear those pauses, you just say, ooh, ooh. But say something. Don't be dead. Don't go, no, I'm not going to say it on Sunday morning. Anyways, today, <laughs> I want to talk about the most interesting and the most influential man in the world. If you have your Bible, I'd love you to open them up to Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter, be it your electronic Bible, whatever it is. I'm going to read verse 30 and verse 31 for our text this morning. This is taken out of the NIV translation, Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. Now, God is addressing ancient Israel. That's his people, his chosen people. I believe if you're here this morning, it's because you're not here because you thought it'd be something nice to do. You're here because God drew you here. God's got a message just for you today. Israel was God's chosen people. 
And God addresses Israel, uh, ancient Israel, saying this in verse 30. I looked for a man among them who would build up a wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. So I will pour out my wrath on them and I I will consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their heads all that they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. Father, I ask you today that your word would fall like a hammer in this place. God, today I'm not just preaching uh, 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 transformation, I'm preaching reformation. God, that you would first reform our minds, our thought price processes. God, that then through that reformation, you would transform the culture that we live in. God, let it begin today in every man's heart, every woman's heart here. Every, every daughter, every son that is looking for a father that's, uh, that, that represents you as a kingdom man. Father, I pray it so that, God, every man's mind would hear, his ears be alert, his heart be receptive. Father, today, that what's heard, God, would reform his life forever, not just for an hour, not just for a day, but for a lifetime and generations to follow him. Father, this I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people that agree with that said, amen. Amen. The question I want to propose to you today is, in light of this passage of Scripture, where do you stand? You see, the text begins with God looking for a man, but not just any kind of man. God is looking for a different kind of man. He's not looking for one that looks like everybody else or lives like everybody else. God's looking for a hero. He's looking for someone who will simply stand in the gap on behalf of the rest of the world. Now, I've taught my sons all of their life for as long as I can remember this one simple definition of what it means to be a man. I teach my sons that being a man means that you protect and defend and provide for those who cannot protect, defend, or provide for themselves. It's a very simple definition, and that was lived out by the ultimate man, who is now king of all kings, lord of all lords. We know him as the Lord Jesus Christ, a kingdom man. A king and a man. Now, for all of us here, you know, we begin this text with with God uh, looking for this kind of man. Looking all over the world. And and, and looking for a man that's going to build a wall of defense. Somebody that's going to protect the rest of the people. Somebody that's going to defend the innocent. Now, here's how this thing works. You see, the Bible says that when, when, when God brings judgment on a land, he causes it to rain on the just, like rain from heaven, as well as the unjust. So in our city, if there was a flash flood warning that would hit us and floods overtook our city, we know that there are some just people in the city. But when the judgment of, of, of God's hand falls upon a people, upon a nation, upon a family. It doesn't just touch the guilty, it touches the innocent. And the scripture tells us that God is, was looking in ancient Israel for such a man, it wasn't your fault, but you know, a lack of competence in your part, on your part caused you to take the life of someone else. And the family, they want justice. So, it, so you get summoned to court. Now, the attorney that would represent you would, rate, would build a defense for you. 
He would not only build a defense for you that would say, you know, this was not intentional. It can happen to anybody. There was no malice of heart, et cetera, et cetera, in the midst of all of that. But then a good attorney would not only say, oh, come on, man, it's not fair to my client. A good attorney would make sure that whatever, whatever the other party, the innocent party, the victim needed, he would make sure that that was provided. He would negotiate that. He would make, he would form a truce. And, and, and so he would, stay, he would raise up a, a wall of the fence. He would stand in the gap for you. He would represent you and say, Your Honor, I, I'm here to tell you that this man right here uh, uh, is a good man. And he may have fallen short, et cetera, et cetera, but he would stand in the gap. Am I making sense? Now, if that attorney represented you and, and got you off the hook, so to speak, in other words, you didn't have to serve uh, uh, any prison sentence, wouldn't you consider that attorney a hero? <clears throat> you know, for me, <clears throat> as, as a leader, I lead, I'm a leader in my home. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, given, I'm, I'm given the responsible to lead my family, and that means I have to, I'm af- I have to make judgment calls. We're going to do this. We're going to go that way. This is right. This is wrong. That's what leaders do. As a leader in this house of faith, as a lead pastor of Hope Alive, I, I, I periodically or even, should I say, frequently have to make judgment decisions. And there will be times that people will come to me and say, you know, pastor, uh, so-and-so did me wrong or did this wrong, and it hurt the rest of the body in this way. And in that moment... By virtue of the role that I play and the responsibility that I'm held accountable for by heaven, I must must not only judge, but I must act accordingly to that judgment that must be rendered. Does that make sense? So when somebody approaches me and says, well, you know, pastor so-and-so, I don't know if you knew this, but this happened, this went down, and, I'm, and I, I make the judgment, and I know that, that some sort of sentence, has, uh, discipline has to be meted out, or correction has to be measured, uh, or meted out. At that moment, uh, I not only just make that decision that I have to act responsibly, but you know what? In that moment, whoever's bringing me the news At that moment, I'm begging them to tell me something good that might lessen the the sentence that has to be served or the price that got to be paid for the wrong behavior that hurt the innocent. I'm saying, I will ask those questions. Come on, man, tell me a little more about that. I I mean, did, did they really intend to act that way or... Did, it, did they really say it that way or, or did you just hear it that way? And I will just continue to investigate, waiting, longing for someone to defend even the guilty at that moment. Looking for somebody to, 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 to build a wall of defensive protection and to, to stand in the gap. I look for that. I long for that. You know, it's so funny, uh, just, just my, my, my children tend to protect one another. And so when, when they know that dad's on the war path, it, don't look at me all holy like that. You know what I'm talking about. Dad's on the war path, the garbage didn't get taken out or something like that, and I, I've, I've had it immediately. You, you know, many a times when I, I mean, when I put the crosshairs on one of those kids, I mean, they don't say, oh, I'm glad it's you. They will begin to make excuses for as to why their brother or their sister did not fulfill their obligations. They begin to stand in the gap for one another. God, listen, listen, when that happens, you would regard that person that's standing in the gap for you a superhero. God's, the text begins with God looking for a certain kind of man. A different kind of man, a hero. And then the the text continues and says this, but God did not find such a man. And our text tells us that God released judgment on a culture because he could not find that kind of man. Let me be a little more accurate in what I'm saying. Basically, God releases his judgment on a people, 
on a culture as a direct result of the absence of biblical manhood in society. He drops the gavel. The judgment is laid. I want you to listen to me. When God Almighty, omniscient, all-knowing, all-seeing cannot find a man, it's a real problem. I mean, if God who knows everything and knows everyone cannot find one man to stand in the gap for an entire nation, then the truth is a real man must be hard to come by. This is God's problem. The indictment goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. God's problem wasn't with Eve. God didn't come looking for Eve in the garden. God went looking for man. Now that's the problem. See, the, God's problem wasn't simply in locating a male or finding a little boy. God could not find a man according to his definition of manhood. And when there is no kingdom man to step up and to fill the gap, the entire culture suffers the impending judgment of God. I'm here to tell you today, don't, bless, don't blame the chaos on politicians. Don't blame the chaos on, on, on world conflict or the lack of, 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 of oil resources or even the economic downturn. Don't blame the, don't blame the, the, the mess that our culture is in on any of those things. God is looking for a man. He's looking for a kingdom man to say, I live for nothing but to fulfill the king's agenda. My life is not my own. I've been bought with a price, purchased by blood. The reason I live is Christ who died for me. I'm not living to drive a big truck, although I have a nice truck. Though I drive a big truck and I like my big truck, I want you to know I'm not living for that big truck. I'm not living for my name or, 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 you know, you know, on, a, or, on, a, on a parking sign somewhere. I'm not living for what's, what, what this world has to offer me. I'm living for what I got to gain in the world to come. That's how I'm living. That's a kingdom man's mindset. I told my wife and, and, and my son yesterday, I was driving. I mean, we had a wonderful family event. And, man, if you didn't go... You're bad. You missed out because we, we had a great time. I mean, incredible memories were created at the lake, and what a great time to be together as a church family. Amen? But I, as I was driving, you, you know, uh, uh, all the way to, uh, you know, up to the lake, you know, the Lord just dropped something in my spirit. Something was just settled. I was just north of, of uh, on I-49, about 20 miles north of the city. And, and God just dropped something in my spirit. And, 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 and let me tell you what he dropped. It was concerning why I give. Why do I give to the Lord? You know, for me, and I know that, and I told my son, I said, you know, the word of God is true. You can't turn, 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 the, turn back the hands of time on the word of God. The, the word of God is true. And, and there are spiritual laws that God set in place like the laws of sowing and reaping. God blesses the giver. And we know the, great, the purer the gift, the greater the sacrifice, the greater the blessing that's to come. Whether it's on this side of eternity or on the other side of eternity, or on, on, on the other side of the threshold of this life, we know that God, that's how God operates. It's, it's spiritual law. God's not a man that he should lie, nor he's a son of man that he should repent. If he spoke it, he'll bring it to pass. The Bible says that God watches over every word that he, spelt, he has ever spoken to make sure that he performs it. If it's a spiritual law, you can bank on it. But you know, it just settled in my spirit as I was driving up to the lake yesterday. That although that law of sowing and reaping is very much God and it's very much true. See, the truth is, you know, I'm going to give whether or not that law, spiritual law existed or not. 
Because the DNA of the kingdom is in me. The DNA of Christ, the new Adam, is in me. And I cannot help but give. It's not a decision that I have to make. It's not whether or not I'm going to give. It's how much can I give? It's not whether or not am I going to give in this situation or that situation or where do I give. The question, it, 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 it has not literally anything to do with The bottom line is I can't help myself but do it. Why? It's the way I'm wired. It's how kingdom men are wired. See, I'm not living to satisfy my desires on this side of eternity. I'm not living as a hedonistic man. I, neither am I living as an irresponsible man. Neither am I living as a domineering man trying to get everybody to succumb to my world definition or my world view. I'm living as a kingdom man. And this is the kind of man that God seeks to, to step in and fill the gap. But the Bible says God could not find such a man according to his decision his definition of manhood. And listen, when that happens, the, listen to me, man of God in your home, priest of the home, your family suffers. Your marriage suffers. Your workplace suffers. The household of faith, the church that you call my church family suffers because men don't step up and fill in the gap. Where is their lack? What are we lacking, pastor? I'll, I'll meet that need. I'll fill that need. And when, that, when men choose to sit on a pew over serving God's purpose for his life, not only is the church weakened, but all of society. Chaos mounts as the impending judgment of God looms over a people and listen real men protect the innocent real men fight and defend and provide for those that, that cannot fight defend or provide for themselves this is this is a picture of a kingdom man you might ask the question why is our culture such a mess I mean at one time this was you, you know uh, when leave it to beaver was the number one rated show in America. I mean, what, what in the world is happening? Now, the new normal. Really? Nothing normal about that at all. I mean, a time when it seems like the world, everything's getting out of control. Why is our culture in such a mess? I think we can, again, look to the word of God and find some answers. Again, when we look at Second Chronicles chapter 15, I'm going to read verse 3. I'm going to skip verse 4. I'm going to read verse 5 and 6. Then at the close of the, close of the, the message uh, this morning, I'll come back and I'll re-inject verse 4. But when we look at this passage this morning, what you'll see is, is a, a, a parallel truth. The same way that God interacted with the culture, with ancient Israel, he interacts with all the cultures of the world, especially America. Stay with me. Second, Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 3. Why is the culture in a mess? For a long time, Israel was, out without, was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. In those days, verse 5, it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the land were in great turmoil. And one nation was being crushed by another, and another city by another. And because God, somebody say God, God, was troubling them with every kind of distress. Let me give you three crucial things that were missing in Israel's national life that brought about the judgment of God. Number one, we see in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 that Israel was missing the true God. Ezekiel was not saying that the Israelites had become atheists or that they no longer believed in God. He wasn't saying that, 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 that the attendance at the temple was down on Sunday morning because it was Father's Day. 
He wasn't saying that the sacrificial fires that burned in the temple were no longer burning. No, the fires were still smoking in Israel. The problem was Israel had lost the correct view of God. And the nation was no longer fulfilling God's agenda. You see, people wanted a convenient God. They wanted a God that they could control. But I'm here to tell you today, if you have a God that you can control, you're God instead of him. Fact. Truth. I see you're processing this morning. You're just downloading this, right? Any God you can boss around isn't the true God. The true God does not adjust to you. You must adjust to the true God. He is either God of all or he is not God at all. That's the truth. See, the truth is people didn't want the true God. They didn't want the true God messing around with their national life or their social life or their financial life or their romantic life. Stay out of my business, God. I'll call on you when I need you. When I need to be bailed out of my trouble, that's when I call on you. Because that's what I heard the other preachers preach. They said, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. True. But woe to that pastor that didn't tell you the rest of the story. Woe to the pastor who said, grace is easy. And there is no price that was paid by a kingdom man called Jesus Christ. A man whom we say, I'll go ahead, keep on sinning because God's grace is misled. Because when he does that, he tramples under his feet. He trods under his feet the very royal blood of eternity. That blood of Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. The people didn't want the true God. They just wanted the preacher to show up and say a nice little prayer before public meetings. They wanted a preacher to marry them and bury them. And every now and then for the holidays, you know, can you say something nice? I might show up at church. All they want, listen, here's the tough thing about this. Not only is this reflective in, in our culture today, but I see this, sometimes this is reflective in the church. Even in the church, sometimes the church isn't very interested in the true God either. Both churches and professed Christians have their own agendas. The question that I'm proposing to you today, are you living by your agenda or are you living according to God's agenda? So what was missing? Number one, in Israel, the true God. Number two, the second thing that was missing was a teaching priest. Now again, the text doesn't say that there were no priests. The problem was simply this, the, the priests had stopped teaching the truth about God. See, they traded, in, uh, they traded enlightenment in for entertainment. Sunday worship was reduced to a social experience. People didn't, didn't take God seriously because the priests, the leaders of the community of faith didn't take God seriously. Israel was suffering from an absence of spiritual leaders who really believed in the full authority of Scripture. They didn't leave, live, or teach as though Scripture is the final authority for all life. That was the problem. Listen to me today. Preachers are responsible for being trumpeteers of the truth. Priests, men, leaders in their home are responsible for being trumpeteers of the truth. And I'm not here today, I didn't come here today or any Sunday to simply tell you the things that you want to hear. Now I know that there are some things that would bring comfort. Can you just tell me I'm going to be all right, I'm in trouble, that God's going to take care of me. I understand that. Pastor, Dar Pastor Darrell, at the opening of the service, he did a great job <coughs> telling you what you wanted to hear. 
I need somebody to pray for me. He prayed for you. You wanted to hear that. But, and it's a part of, of the full expression of your faith. I got that. But I didn't come here this morning simply to tell you what you want to hear. When I come here on Sunday mornings, I'm coming here to tell you what you need to hear. And yes, even what you have to hear. Not just what you need, but what you have to hear. Even when you're turning your cheek on me and you're, you're turning around and saying, I don't, I don't, man, don't talk to me about that. Why? Why? Because if I don't do that, your God conscience, your conscious awareness of God will be rocked to sleep. Just as, 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 as the worship leader saying uh, earlier this morning, awaken me, God. That God consciousness will be rocked to sleep in your life. You'll be put to sleep and you will lose a sense of right and wrong. And each person will become a, a law unto themselves. And we see this all over the culture. All over. Even in our public schools. Kids are being taught that there are no absolutes. As a, you know, they're, they're being told one person's answer is just as right as everybody else's answer. Listen, don't be hoodwinked on that. Don't be deceived. There is one truth. There is one way. There is one Christ. There is one accurate interpretation of the scripture, not many. And all of us will, 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 will give an account as to whether or not we lived according to that accurate interpretation of scripture. That's why we might all want to be invested in, in, in being students of the word of God. So the answer, uh, well, what was the result? No law, no priest teaching the truth. The result, social chaos. Absolute chaos. The world being turned upside down. You see, the third thing that was missing was God's law. I want you to listen to me. Hear me out. When a culture has, number one, a false view of God. And number two, is built on bad information. Number three, God begins to remove the restraint of his law. And evil begins to grow unbridled. You see, what checks our flesh when, when, when our spirit isn't willing is the law that we know that there's going to be a consequence to bad behavior. If I don't abide by the law, then I know that there's going to be a consequence. So it sort, of, it sort of keeps our flesh bridled in check, does it not? So when, when, the, when, the, when the rule of God's law is missing, then chaos replaces community. And when God leaves a society, when he exits a family, when he departs from a marriage, hope goes with him any hope any any expectation for good to come in the future leaves you see as long but as long as as you have God you always have hope you see if God's still in the picture so long as God's agenda is still on the table it's not over till it's over even if circumstances collapse around you and it seems like everything's falling apart, God will keep you. With God, there is hope. Without God, no hope. Somebody ought to give him some praise right now. Look, I know I'm preaching this morning. And I know, I, I, I know I'm plowing. I know I'm going at it. But you need to hear this. You have to hear this today. Something's got to be adjusted in your life, bro, man, gentleman. Something has got to change. And you are the agent of change that God's looking for. He's looking for a response today. He's looking for a man, not just any kind of man. Oh, but I work so much. I ain't got time to give uh, to, to God's agenda. No, you can. See, the real problem Here's the real problem. And what I find, found stunning about the situation in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 is that God was the cause of Israel's distress. 
the pressure came in on them. It wasn't from sinners. It wasn't even the devil. The pressure was coming from God. Did not we read that? In verse 5 of 2 Chronicles chapter uh, 15. In those days, it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the land were in great turmoil. And one nation was being crushed, crushed, somebody say crushed, by another. And one city by another. Why? Because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. Listen to me, I'm Pentecostal. I pray in tongues. I cast out devils. I lay hands on sick people. But I, I'm really convinced most of the time uh, the issue, the, the battle I'm fighting is not with, it's, it's not that spiritual battle, you know, in that dimension. It's with the rebellious, egotistical, self-absorbed will of men. Men choosing to believe a lie over the truth. And even in Pentecostal, charismatic, faith-filled circles such as this, when people go around and say, God, I feel God's leading me. I feel God. And I'm thinking, man, what you need to do is feel your way through the word of God because what you're doing doesn't, uh, needs to adjust to the word of truth, the word of God, period. If I hear that one more time, I, you know, no, I'm not going to do it because I'm, I'm, I'm I'm exercising self-control. But I, I'd love just, just to smack people sometimes. Just be led by the Spirit. No, no, I, I see immature people over and over again try to justify bad behavior, their own agenda to supersede God's agenda or God's authority and try to, you know, to soften the blow. They say, I feel God's, God's saying this or God's saying that. No, 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 listen to me. If you're going to mature in your faith, and we, we are led by the Spirit that way. But if you're going to know which way is right, which way is wrong, you got to be a student of the Word of God. you got to be surrounded by, by mature men and women of faith that will say, as you grow in your faith, yes, that sounds like God. No, that's really your agenda. That's not God's agenda. It must exist. See, the real problem was not, uh, you, you know, Troubles being, in, in, you know, invading people's lives or a nation, you know, because of other, uh, other sinners are hurting them, attacking them, or, or, or it was a devil problem. No, no, no. The pressure they were feeling financially, economically, physically, circumstantially was the hand of God. Now, my, my second oldest boy, Joshua, you know, he's a student in the College of Engineering at UL. I'm amazed by the way he has adapted, because my son Josh has, has communicated to me and his mom since he was five years old that he felt that he, he had a clarion call of God on his life. As a matter of fact, when he graduated kindergarten, for the kindergarten graduation, he got up and, and he was dressed in a little jacket, a little tie, and he had his Bible with him, and he said, when I grow up, I want to be a preacher like my dad. He never changed that. He never redirected himself. It was you know, a, little, a little heart responding to a big God's voice, promptings. Now, as Josh grew up, I told Josh, I'm not going to send you to the cemetery, I mean seminary, <laughs> because you have a life education of seeing faith lived out in a marriage and in a home right here and I told him I said Josh you're going to go get an education and it's and your first degree will not be in biblical studies it's going to have to be in another arena of life and then when you want to go to grad school you can pursue that and do however you want to do but but I kind of invoked the the daddy influence on him so Josh has made his way through school and found himself landed uh, in, in, the, in, you know, in the College of Engineering at UL. Now, I, this little brother really amazes me. I have never, I've ne I never studied so hard. And I've never, really, I've never seen anybody else study so hard personally. But I watched this young man work part-time job, be totally involved in the full, you know, in ministry, 
talking about probably anywhere between 15 to 20 hours a week, devoted all of his heart to ministry, work a part-time job, a full-time student, and yet still be filled with joy. And, and I, I, you know, I, 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 how can that be? When you say you want to be in full-time ministry, but yet you found fulfillment, and I'm making you go to school. And he said, let me tell you why, Papa. He said, my whole life is, is worship unto the Lord. And he is, he's like, he's really intrigued by the sciences, physics and math and, and, and the biology, all those. He, he's intrigued by it. And he says, because he, he said, my approach, Pop, is, you know, God is the God of all creation. He, he, he calculated all these formulas before the, before the foundation of the world. And when I'm studying, I'm just discovering his creation. I'm connected with him. He told me this the other day. He said, Pop, one of the laws of physics is simply this. Because we were talking about people being under a lot of pressure. And when people are under pressure, sometimes they'll just collapse. Here's just a spiritual truth. I want you to hear me out this morning. Are you, are you okay? I'm about to close. As a matter of fact, for, can I get the worship team to come quickly just to fake these, fake these people out? You're the second service. You weren't really worried about getting to lunch on time, were you? Okay. I was telling him the other day, I said, I said, Josh, here's just the truth. Listen to me. I said, the reason why people, never, so many people will never experience the breakthrough in their life is because they break down before they get a break, an opportunity to have the breakthrough. So between the break that leads to the breakthrough, there's a lot of pressure on your life. And we would begin to think that financial pressure or whatever, circumstantial pressure is coming from, in charismatic circles, Pentecostal circles, faith-filled circles, that it's coming from a devil or it's coming from people that are out to get us. And the truth of Scripture here is that it's coming from God. God adjusting your life according to his agenda. And Josh told me this about, and I thought, wow, man, that's, that's, that's really, I said, I'm going to have to preach about that. But he said, Pop, the law of physics, physics, physics will simply say this. If you have a vessel, and that vessel is filled with something, when pressure begins to squeeze that vessel on both sides, whatever is on the inside of that vessel will explode. It will reach out. See, if you're full of God on the inside when pressure comes, you're going to be catapulted to the next level of your faith and relationship with Jesus Christ. But if that vessel is empty on the inside, there's nothing in there. When the pressure begins to squeeze on that vessel from both sides, what happens? That vessel collapses. It caves in. It breaks down. That's the difference. See, the real problem in, in, in all of the chaos in our culture, maybe in your own family, is not coming from necessarily from a devil or because your, your spouse is a sinner. It could just be coming from God. And it could be the result of you not living according, could be, to God's agenda. When God's in the picture, there's always hope. When God's out of the picture, there is no hope. The real problem, the distress was coming from God. Here's the real answer. The real answer is a real man who's full of the word of God, full of the character of Christ, full of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, full of willing obedience, a real man to stand up and to stand in the gap upon behalf of others. A kingdom man is the real answer. A kingdom man who will eagerly and joyfully operate under the agenda of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
How many guys appreciate this word this morning? Amen. <laughs> I want to wrap this thing up this morning. I told you that I skipped one little verse of scripture in our text. And I did it for a reason. I did it so that you would leave here with hope. I've spoken the truth. Now let me release the hope of God in your life. The good news this morning is that that one verse, 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 4, says this. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him. And he was found by them. Listen, I'm here to declare you to, I'm here to declare to you today that it's not over till it's over. The final trumpet hasn't been sound, sounded in heaven. The voice of the archangel has not, has not summoned the church up in the heaven, leaving the world without men and women who are still proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm here to declare to you today that I believe that there are men and women all over this building watching by television right now who are responding to the call of God. They're saying, here I am, Lord. I'll build the wall. I'll be that man. I'll stand in the gap. You can send me. I'll do it. I'll live for you. I'll, I'll give you full access and full authority over my life. Every aspect. That's what I believe. That's what I'm utterly convinced of this morning. I want to pray for you today. If in your heart you sense that yearning and that calling, the voice of God asking you to step up your game, don't just live as a casual Christian, but rather as a kingdom man. If you're hearing that call of God, I want to encourage you today, respond. Just say yes, Lord. Quit arguing in your mind and trying to figure it out and try to adjust God to your terms. I'm telling you, I've spoken the truth to you today. And if I'm inaccurate, God will deal with me. But if you don't respond, God will deal with you. And I'm here to tell you today, I'm convinced that there's hope for you. And there's hope for your family. And there's hope for this church. There's hope for this community. There is still hope for this nation because of men of God responding to a kingdom call, saying, I'll fill the gap. I want to pray for every male in this house today. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And when I do, I want every male in this house to make their way forward right here. And I'm going to pray for you today. I'm going to pray that, that the mantle of Elijah will fall on you, even as in your heart you respond to the calling of God. When we do, I'm going to ask everybody to stand because I'm going to ask the ladies and all the rest of the congregation just to surround us with faith, that you, would, you guys would pray with these men as I pray for them. Amen? On the count of three, would you stand up and all men come and see me? One, two, three, come. Come quickly. Quickly. Men, come quickly. Can I tell you what's impressing me today? Can I tell you what, it, what, what, what impresses me today? When you stood up, all of the spirit realm shifted. There was a shaking in the heavens when you stood up. Let me tell you what impresses me today. What I saw today is there are as many, if not more, men in this service today than there are women. That's a testimony to what God's doing right here among you. 
men responding to a call. I'm honored to be in a house with men who are seeking God's face. Amen. <laughs> That's impressive. That's impressive. If in your heart today you're saying, Pastor, I'm going to step up my game. I want to be a kingdom man like this. I'm going to live as a kingdom man. I want to pray for you today. That God would empower you not just to live for a day. Not just to live for the next week. But for a lifetime. That you would live as a kingdom man. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and lift your hands to the Lord while I pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, every man here today. I pray the opening, God, the, the, the opening of the curtains of heaven over their life. And I pray, Lord God, that you would loose the mantle of Elijah. You said in the last days, you would turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons to the fathers. Fathers, God, men, kingdom men, look at them, God. God, they're standing right here. God, I'm standing in the gap for them as they're stepping up, saying, God, I'm going to stand in the gap for my family. I'm going to stand in the gap for my church. I'm going to stand in the gap for my community, my nation. Father, I pray today, let the weighty glory of that mantle rest upon their inner man. Envelop them with your power, with your glory. That God, there is no turning back in their life. That they live in constant pursuit of the great king's agenda. Let it rest upon them, flood their soul, overtake and consume their life. Father, this I pray, that you would distinguish them today. Set them apart, separate them from the rest of the herd. They're not going to be just any kind of man. But today, they receive the mantle of Elijah to be a kingdom man in Jesus name now, if you receive that gentleman say amen 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 Pastor Bobby would love to have the opportunity to pray for you and your family our service times are Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock if you would like more information about the ministries of Hope Alive Freedom Church check out our website at www.hopealive.com and thanks again for tuning in